five PLJ in an abandoned warehouse with no lights, just shadows, and soon no rabbits. The purpose of the event is to pass the torch from one generation heavy metal to the next, and there lies in this black leather hunting outfit with a shotgun guitar with spikes coming out of it, Ozzy Fudd, the Rabbit Slayer. A shimmering white cream of a blade, and the double is paid. When the axe comes down, a chewing sound. Steel gets the head, another rabbit's dead. I'm a rabbit swayer, a guitar player with a nasty habit. Kill the rabbit! <laughs> Good morning, it's Saturday, Enemies of My Country Saturday, May the 18th, and this is The True Conservative. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today. So today, after the serenity prayer and the patriotic song of the day, we will have no free lunch, rules for radical conservatives, rules for retrogrades, rules for patriots, Bishop Barron, Ayn Rand, the 33 strategies of war, and the enemies of my country. All that and more when I get back. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I should not change, the courage to change the things I should, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen.
Thank you. Thank you. Now there's no free lunch. 250 Economic Truths by David Bonson. Thus, there are no solutions in the tragic vision, but only trade-offs that still leave many desires unfulfilled and much unhappiness in the world. What is needed in this vision is a prudent sense of how to make the best trade-offs from the limited options available and a realization that unmet needs will necessarily remain, that attempting to fully meet those needs seratum only deprives other people of other things so that a society pursuing such a policy is like a dog chasing its tail. Thomas Sowell. There is no free lunch. Economics is the decision-making process embedded in human action. We price in risks and weight them against hopeful rewards, and we do this with remarkable efficiency. We may misgauge a certain risk, and we find ourselves on the wrong side of a risk-reward trade-off, but that is the essence of economics. Trade-offs are not bad things. They are a fact of life. The only time trade-offs become unbearable is when we deny their basic inevitability to begin with. And that was There's No Free Lunch by David Bonson. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, rules for radical conservatives. You bitter clingers, like battered wives still married to abusive spouses, have persisted in the foolish belief that this is all transitory. That one day you'll wake up and your local daily rag won't be a seething cauldron of leftist hatred, blatantly misreported stories, especially evident when you have first-hand knowledge of the events in the report, and shadily and selectively edited news judgment that leaves out anything of interest or importance to you in favor of a conformist Weltanschauung that presupposes a single Stalinist contextual view of how the news of the world is to be apprehended. In general, conservatives have come late to the alternative media party, but that the audience exists, there can be no doubt. Rush Limbaugh seized the high ground of talk radio decades ago, and now Fox News routinely outdraws its rivals CNN, MSNBC, and CNBC combined. The fact that liberal publications and TV networks, despite their overwhelming numerical superiority, react to Fox News like vampires to the cross, ought to tell you something. Since their greatest scorn, like that for Sarah Palin, is reserved for that which they fear most. So, re-infiltrate the media already. All of it. Old and new. Create alternative institutions that reflect a way of looking at and dealing with the world that mirrors what you call reality. It's no accident, back in the good old days of La Revolution, that the Sandinistas or whichever raggle-taggle band of taco or non-taco-eating Marxist guerrillas holding Soviet AK-47s in one hand and Mao's little red book in the other, even though we support all Latin American revolutionary movements, like most gringos, Everything from Tijuana to Tierra del Fuego pretty much seems the same to us. Always made it their first order of business to seize the local prensa or radio station. Because they knew that reality is best dictated by the media as opposed to the peasants' lying eyes. And so the sooner they could play won't get fooled again over the imported rent funk, the quicker the tequila could start flowing again and the money start rolling in and out. Go thou and do likewise. Oh, you don't have to do anything as messy and as, frankly, terrifying as threatening us with all those guns we know you have locked away against the day when some wingnut calls for an armed march on Washington, or at least Austin. But those of you who have been smart enough to see the future, talk radio and the electronic media, know by now that the way to break the power of the New York Times is not to finally get one of their colonists to find Jesus, but to simply ignore them. Yes, ignore them. I myself haven't read the Times for years now, and it hasn't done me a bit of harm. Why, I could write a mock op-ed piece right this minute, and I defy you to tell me it wasn't composed by one of their highly paid scribes, who collectively waste what was once the most valuable journalistic real estate in the world by scratching each other's backs, quoting each other's columns, phoning each other's sources, and buying each other lunch. I, too, can abuse the first-person pronoun with the best of them, publicly confess my congenital timidity and cowardice, whine about the dearth of good men in this world, reach for cheap pop cultural references, sing show tunes, 
an otherwise turn-in copy that would disgrace a high school newspaper. And so probably could you. So forget about conquering the times. It's a lost cause, and you don't need to assume their debt payments. Instead, for a pittance, you can set yourself up on the Internet, writing about things you know about. Who cares if you're not a great writer? See paragraph above. If you know your subject, you know your subject. And surely we have all experienced the truth of the dictum that whenever you read about something you actually know about in a newspaper, you realize that it is a great steaming load of horse apples. But then when you turn to the other sections, gospel! Well, only you can break that cycle. And you don't even have to be a professional journalist to do it. You can set pixels to blank cyberspace, and presto, you're a whistleblower, a guru, an expert witness. No longer will it be possible for one product, such as a newspaper, a magazine, or a television network, to pretend to truth. Glenn Reynolds, the instapundit himself, calls the blogosphere writers an army of Davids, slaying the Sixth Avenue Goliaths from the comfort of their dens, and in their pajamas to boot. Which brings me to corollary number two. Stop thinking that Hollywood is a dirty word. And this, ladies and germs, is where your pals in the Christian right are going to have to suck it up for a while. You see, here in Hollywood, there is nothing we fear more than the Christian right. Why, even the 17 politically conservative Christians out here fear the Christian right. Because we all, yes, every man jack of us, at Jerry's Famous Deli and Nate and Al's and Dominic's across from Cedars and the Casa Vega and Sherman Oaks on Ventura in the Valley and Pinto Bistro and hell, even Tesh in my neighborhood of Echo Park and, well, you get the idea. Worried that they might mess with our deathless art instead of reserving that privilege to our super smart studio execs, agents, production assistants, drivers, and caterers. And that was uh, chapter middle part of chapter 22 from Rules for Radical Conservatives by David Kahane. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, instead of uh, Rules for Retrogrades, it's going to be Don't Think of an Elephant, Chapter 2, Know Your Values and Frame the Debate by Dr. George Lakoff. Some updates have been made. When I teach the study of framing at Berkeley in Cognitive Science 101, the first thing I do is give my students an exercise. The exercise is... Don't think of an elephant. Whatever you do, do not think of an elephant. I've never found a student who is able to do this. Every word like elephant evokes a frame which can be an image or other kinds of knowledge. Elephants are large, have floppy ears, tusks, and a trunk, live naturally in jungles, are associated with circuses, and so on. The word is defined relative to that frame. When we negate a frame, we evoke the frame. Richard Nixon found that out the hard way. While under pressure to resign during the Watergate scandal, Nixon addressed the nation on TV. He stood before the nation and said, I am not a crook. And everybody thought about him as a crook. This gives us a basic principle of framing. When you are arguing against the other side, do not use their language. Their language picks out a frame, and it won't be the frame you want. Let me give you an example. On the day that George W. Bush arrived in the White House, the phrase tax relief started coming out of the White House. It was repeated almost every day thereafter, was used in the press in describing his policies, and slowly became so much a part of public discourse that liberals started using it. Think of the framing for relief. For there to be relief, there must be an affliction, an afflicted party, and a reliever who removes the affliction and is therefore a hero. And if people try to stop the hero, those people are villains for trying to prevent relief. When the word tax is added to relief, the result is a metaphor. Taxation is an affliction. And the person who takes it away is a hero, and anyone who tries to stop him is a bad guy. This is a frame. It is made up of ideas like affliction and hero. 
The language that evokes the frame comes out of the White House, and it goes into press releases, goes to every radio station, every TV station, every newspaper. And soon the New York Times is using tax relief. And it is not only on Fox. It is on CNN. It is on NBC. It is on every station because it is the president's tax relief plan. And soon the Democrats are using tax relief and shooting themselves in the foot. It is remarkable. We have seen Democrats adopting the conservative view of taxation as an affliction when they have offered tax relief for the middle class. They were accepting the conservative frame. The conservatives had set a trap. The words draw you into their world view. That is what framing is about. Framing is about getting language that fits your world view. It is not just language. The ideas are primary. And the language carries those ideas, evokes those ideas. There was another noteworthy example of conservative framing in George W. Bush's State of the Union address in January 2005. This one was a remarkable metaphor to find in a State of the Union address. President Bush said, we do not need a permission slip to defend America. What was going on with a permission slip? He could have just said, we won't ask permission. But talking about a permission slip is different. Think about when you last needed a permission slip. Think about who has to ask for a permission slip. Think about who is being asked. Think about the relationship between them. Those are the kinds of questions you need to ask if you are to understand contemporary political discourse. While you are contemplating them, I want to raise other questions for you. My work on politics began when I asked myself just such a question. It was back in the fall of 1994. I was watching election speeches and reading the Republicans' contract with America. The question I asked myself was this. What do the conservatives' positions on issues have to do with each other? If you are a conservative, what does your position on abortion have to do with your position on taxation? And I'm going to stop it right there. Uh, this is Chapter 2, Don't Think of an Elephant, but Dr. George... George Lakoff. A couple of things. First of all, he assumes that conservatism is about politics. It's not. Conservatism is cultural. Uh, Republicanism is politics. The other thing that he said in here that I have been emphasizing is he says, don't use their words. Okay. All these instructions that he's giving to Democrats is are instructions that we Republicans can and should use. Okay, so when uh, you hear the left talking about the homeless, we don't call them the homeless. We call them squatters and trespassers because squatters and trespassers implies law enforcement. It in, in, implies illegal activity, criminal activity. We can win an argument about law enforcement and, uh, and uh, against illegal activity all day long. The uh, homeless one is one of compassion, okay? And compassion usually means higher taxes, more taxes, more fees, more money, going to a government that thinks it has rights, and it doesn't. It thinks it has the right to take uh, people off the street. It thinks it has the right to prevent homelessness. It has no such thing. If you doubt me, check the Constitution. So, uh, again, one of the most valuable things he pointed out so far in this chapter is watch the words that you use. Okay, Don't call them migrants. Animals migrate, people immigrate, and emigrate. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Now, Rules for Patriots by Steve Deese. Chapter 9. Commandment number 8. Always make your opponent defend their record slash belief system. Your Republican champion is ready to take on a notoriously liberal member of the mainstream media. 
who is a Democrat talking point regurgitator masquerading as an objective journalist. His show might as well be called The Graveyard, because so many conservatives have gone there to die in the past that grassroots patriots wonder why Republicans even agree to do it at all anymore. For the sake of argument, let's say his name is Keith. And Keith is snotty, snarky, and worst of all, smart. Like wickedly smart. The kind of guy you wish was on your side. He's also not known for exchanging pleasantries and goes right for the throat with his very first question. Mr. Republican, you've been critical of Democrats calling for more policies to help the poor and downtrodden in our abundantly wealthy society, saying they are too expensive and taxpayers shouldn't be asked to shoulder such a burden. It's easy for those who are well off like you to focus first on their own needs and not the needs of others. But I believe I am my brother's keeper. You claim to be a Christian. So isn't it the moral thing to care for the less fortunate? Surely, in a country as wealthy as ours, there is no excuse for poverty. Instead of tax cuts for the rich, shouldn't we put others less fortunate first? As he closes his mini monologue, masquerading as a question, the liberal host squares his shoulders and begins to subtly strut like a peacock. Keith is confident because this line of emotion-based drivel has driven so many other previous Republicans into the fetal position on his program. Interesting take, Keith. How much do you think is enough, Mr. Republican asked the liberal host? Certainly in a $6 trillion economy, there's enough to ensure income equality, is there not, he says? Well, if you believe so strongly in that principle, why don't you start by living it out in your own life, Mr. Republican says matter-of-factly. What are you talking about, Keith responds. I'm not the public official here, you are. So since you're the one making public policy, you're the one who has the burden of proof. Nice try, Keith, Mr. Republican says. I might be making public policy, but you're trying to shape it and influence it as well. Therefore, your opinion matters at least as much as mine, and you're required to be at least as accountable as is me. Therefore, perhaps your audience would be interested in knowing that you made $10.6 million last year, according to industry trade reports. Keith gets a sly grin on his face. Steady, Mr. Republican. That is what I made. But you made over $120 million last year, according to your publicly released tax records. I'm doing well, but I'm not even in your ballpark. Mr. Republican smiles back winsomely. It's true. My family and I have been very blessed. This is why last year we gave $15 million to charitable causes like Animal Rescue League, homeless shelters, orphanages, and several overseas missionaries, along with what we gave back to our church. The reason you didn't get a press release on that is because my faith tells me not to publicize my giving for personal gain, but to give to others in honor of how much God has given me. I'm only bringing it up now because you brought up my personal financial situation, making it fair game. So you're touting the fact you gave $15 million to charity, which is more than I make in a year? You still have over $100 million left after that, which is 10 times what I made, Keith says. Actually, after Uncle Sam takes his cut off the top, my family ended up giving almost 20% of our income away. And that doesn't count the personal investments we made in stocks and real estate with our income that helped stimulate the economy by creating more jobs to handle those capital investments. How much did you give to charity last year? Keith is now starting to get fidgety. Off the top of my head, I don't know, he says warily. Well, let me help you with that. Mr. Republican pauses. Just kidding. I couldn't access your tax records without committing a felony or going to work for the NSA. And since you're not a Tea Partier, you don't have to worry about the IRS auditing you. But would you say you're at least as charitable as the last Democrat vice president of the United States? Absolutely. Joe is a fine man who loves his neighbor as he loves himself, Keith says, his confidence suddenly returned. Mr. Republican pauses again for effect and then says, Keith, then you're in some dubious company. Because according to their publicly released tax records, the Bidens gave an average of $369 per year to charity in the 10 years prior to him becoming vice president when he was serving in the U.S. Senate. That's about 0.3% of his income. Keith is now getting visibly flustered. Well, well, those were the lean years of the Bush recession and money was kind of tight. Mr. Republican now moves in for the kill. Well, to your point, the vice president's giving did go up after becoming Obama's vice president to a grand total of 1.4 percent of his income. When you consider over 80 percent of Biden's income was from the taxpayers and 100 percent of my family's income comes from our own labors, I forgo my salary as an elected official and our private income was used to create jobs and opportunities for others. Why don't you ask your audience who cares more for their fellow man?
Keith gives Mr. Republican a condescending golf clap. Well played, sir. Well played. I'll give you this. You've got more chutzpah than most of the Republicans that can come on this show. Fine, I'll grant the point that you and your family have been successful, responsible, and charitable. But then why not extend that responsibility and charity to others? Regardless of what you're doing in your personal life, which I applaud, your public policy positions are abhorrent. Do you? So uh, that is, uh, he said, chapter 9. said so reads here chapter 11, but either way. Um, Rules for Patriots, how conservatives can win again by Steve Deese. Now, the, the problem here is that the scenario he's describing is a, either a Republican activist of some sort or a Republican office holder that is being interviewed. The question is, what good does uh, his demonstration of the proper way to handle things do for the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers? None. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, The Daily Dad for May the 18th. May 18th. Teach them to do the right thing. Just that you do the right thing. The rest doesn't matter. Marcus Aurelius. In the beautiful and hilarious novel, A Man Called Ove, a young Ove is working at the same rail yard as his father. He is cleaning a car with another worker, Tom, when they find a briefcase left by a passenger. Instinctively, Tom goes to steal it. Ove is surprised. A few seconds later, he finds and picks up a wallet left by a different passenger. Just then, O's father walks in, and he asks Ove what he wants to do with the wallet. Ove suggests that they return it to the lost and found, where it is quickly claimed by the woman who lost it. Not many people have ever handed in this much money, the woman says. Well, O's father replies, many people don't have any decency either. Later that evening, Ove asks his father why he didn't tell management about the briefcase that Tom had stolen. His father shakes his head and replies, We're not the sort of people who tell tales about what others do. In both instances, Ove's father is showing his boy what decency looks like. Decency is about what you do. It's not a standard you hold others to. Decency is what you do with the money you find. It's how you raise your kids. It's not something you wield. It's not something you gossip about. It's something you embody and embrace. That's uh, The Daily Dad by Ryan Holiday. And uh, he's saying pretty much the same thing I am, which is be conservative, have a conservative family, raise a conservative family, surround yourself with conservatives. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, Bishop Robert Barron. Everything in this world finally has this quality of evanescence. It doesn't last. So, yeah, I've labored like crazy, built up this business, I made a lot of money. That's a good thing. It's not going to last because you're going to fade away and it's all going to go to somebody else. Should I just be depressed then? No, no. I should be detached. Yeah, it's good. Wealth, power, pleasure. Take it in and then let it go. Enjoy it. Sure, the way you enjoy like a a firework going off. Boom, there it is. Look how beautiful that burst of light and color. And then it's gone. Do I despair? No, I I just kind of learn to live in that present moment, savoring what I can, but also letting go. Why? Why? Because I realize that the true good, the truly beautiful belongs to a higher world. I can sense it in these things, but none of the things in the world last. And so if I cling to them, they, they disappear. And that was Bishop Robert Barron. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, the Ayn Rand thought of the day. Ending campus protests protects free speech. 
Protests against the, against the Israeli war in Gaza are engulfing private and state-run universities across the country, from Columbia University to UCLA to the University of Texas at Austin, with more than 2,000 protesters from almost 50 campuses already arrested. Reactions to footage of police marching in right gear to break up the encampments and detain students and professors have been sharp. Even critics of the protesters' agenda have described the arrests as violation of free speech. Some defenders of the police actions concede the point. To them, the need to quell campus protesters just shows that free speech rights are not absolute. Wrong. It's precisely because all rights, including the right of free speech, are absolutes that many of these protests are justifiably shut down by the police. The right to free speech protects everyone's ability to express ideas, even the most vicious of ideas, to anyone who chooses to listen. It protects the expression against anyone who would forcibly interfere, whether a government bent on censoring a book praising Marx and Mao or a racist mob that destroys the printing presses of a newspaper speaking up for justice. We each need to be able to express and listen to ideas of our choosing, even false ideas, if we are to rationally search for the truth. The First Amendment prohibits government from enacting laws that violate anyone's freedom of speech. It imposes no restrictions or obligations on private individuals or organizations such as Columbia University. Students choose a university like Columbia to get an education from its professors, not to be subjugated to or subjected to political harangues from other students. To advance its educational mission, Columbia rightly needs to set rules about how its property is used and which viewpoints are tough on its premises. When a mob of students and non-students invades the Columbia campus, sets up an encampment on its quadrangle, creates a nuisance that interferes with the business of education, and even bars other students and professors, professors from entering and attending classes, these protesters are interfering with the property and free speech rights of the university. Columbia didn't have to wait for protesters to break into Hamilton Hall to justifiably have the police eject them. State-run universities like UCLA and the University of Texas at Austin are crucially different. The Supreme Court has ruled that they are subject to the First Amendment. When areas of a state-run campus like quads are deemed designated public forums, a state-run university cannot restrict the content or viewpoints expressed by protesters. In such forums, the university can set reasonable time, manner, and place conditions on expression consistent with its purpose of functioning as an educational institution. As awful as anti-Semitism is, government's business is not to take sides on questions of ideology. Private institutions can eject students for expressing anti-Semitic content, but a state-run university cannot. It can only stop those who violate time, manner, and place conditions in public forums. Indeed, it must do so in order to protect the rights of non-protesters. The right to free speech is not a value to be balanced against law and order. The only valued valid purpose of law and order is to protect the rights of citizens, including the rights to property and to free speech, which the government must treat as absolutes. When government itself violates these rights, as it may have at UT Austin, it should be rebuked. But when it intervenes to protect these rights, as it did in Columbia, and should have done sooner at UCLA and elsewhere, it deserves praise. And uh, that was the Ayn Rand Thought of the Day And uh, I just wanted to say that, again, free speech is about property. The fundamental right is property rights. You have all the free speech you you want on your own property. You have no right because your rights end where my rights begin. Okay, so when we're looking at is it it our rights absolute or not absolute, Um, your rights end where my rights begin. You don't get to come onto my property without my permission uh, to express anything, whether it's whether I like it, uh, what you have to say, or I don't. Okay, so that's the number one thing. UCLA is still property. It's state property. So the UCLA has the right or the authority to um, enforce property rights. Now, the other thing is with my rights and your rights, my rights end where your rights begin, is as a protester, I have no right to prevent somebody else from speaking, from exercising their right uh, to free speech. If I do that, 
then I am I am the bad guy. I'm violating their rights, and uh, law enforcement should uh, be getting involved and uh, investigate, prosecute as appropriate. And that was the uh, again the Ayn Rand thought of the day. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. So uh, if you're a Democrat, you should be voting Republican and become a Republican because the pressure's off. Uh, On the Democrat side of the the ticket, the Democrats are under constant pressure to produce paradise and to produce it yesterday. The Democrat Party is about 50 years behind schedule. They should have created paradise about 50 years ago, but they failed to do so. So the pressure is on, the pressure is on, the pressure is on. Got to get the movement, got to get... Perfect, 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 perfect. And from the time you get up in the morning until the time you go to bed at night, you're under the gun. Your fellow Democrats are looking at you wondering why it is that you're going to Starbucks instead of doing something to create socialist paradise. But in the Republican Party, no such thing. Because we're realistic. We know there's never been a paradise. There isn't now. And therefore, there is not going to be any type of paradise other than the second coming of Jesus Christ. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now about five minutes worth of the 33 Strategies of War. Keys to Warfare To survive and advance at all in life, we find ourselves constantly having to use other people for some purpose, some need. To obtain resources we cannot get on our own. To give us protection of some sort. To compensate for a skill or talent we do not possess. As a description of human relationships, however, the word use has ugly connotations. And in any case, we always like to make our actions seem nobler than they are. We prefer to think of these interactions as relationships of assistance, partnering, friendship. This is not a matter of mere semantics. It is the source of a dangerous confusion that will harm you in the end. When you look for an ally, you have a need, an interest you want met. This is a practical, strategic matter upon which your success depends. If you allow emotions and appearances to infect the kinds of alliances you form, you are in danger. The art of forming alliances depends on your ability to separate friendship from need. The first step is to understand that all of us constantly use other people to help and advance ourselves. Bowen went so far as to use his own family in an experiment to solve a professional dilemma. There is no shame in this, no need to ever feel guilty. Nor should we take it personally when we realize that someone else is using us. Using people is a human and social necessity. Next, with this understanding in mind, you must learn to make these necessary alliances strategic ones, aligning yourself with people who can give you something you cannot get on your own. This requires that you resist the temptation to let your decisions about alliances be governed by your emotions. Your emotional needs are what your personal life is for, and you must leave them behind when you enter the arena of social battle. The alliances that will help you most are those involving mutual self-interest. Alliances infected with emotions or with ties of loyalty and friendship are nothing but trouble. Being strategic with your alliances will also keep you from the bad entanglements that are the undoing of so many. Think of your alliances as stepping stones toward a goal. Over the course of your life, you will be constantly jumping from one stone to the next to suit your needs. When this particular river is crossed, you will leave them behind you. We will call this constant shifting yet advancing use of allies the alliance game. Many key principles of the alliance game originated in ancient China, which was composed of numerous states in continual flux, now weak, now powerful, now weak again. War was a dangerous affair, for a state that invaded another 
would stir up a lot of mistrust among the others and would often find itself losing ground in the long run. Meanwhile, a state that remained too loyal to an ally might find itself pulled into a war from which it could not break free and would go down in the process. The formation of proper alliances was in some ways a more important art than that of warfare itself, and the statesmen adept at this art were more powerful than military leaders. It was through the alliance game that the state of Qin was able to slowly expand during the dangerous Warring States period of 403 to 221 B.C. Qin would make alliances with distant states and attack nearby ones. The nearby state that Qin had invaded could not get help from its outlying neighbor because that neighbor was now allied to Qin. If Qin faced an enemy that had a key ally, it would work first to disrupt the alliance, sowing dissension, spreading rumors, courting one of the two sides with money, until the alliance fell apart. Then, Qin would invade first one of the two states, then the other. Gradually, bit by bit, it gobbled up neighboring states until, in the late 3rd century B.C., it was able to unify China, a remarkable feat. To play the alliance game right, today as in ancient China, you must be realistic to the core, thinking far ahead and keeping the situation as fluid as possible. The ally of today may be the enemy of tomorrow. Sentiment has no place in the picture. If you are weak but clever, you can slowly leapfrog into a position of strength by bouncing from one alliance to another. The opposite approach is to make a key alliance and stick with it, valuing trust and an established relationship. This can work well in stable times, but in periods of flux, which are more common, it can prove to be your undoing. Differences in interest will inevitably emerge, and at the same time it will become hard to disentangle yourself from a relationship in which so much emotion has been invested. It is safer to bank on change, to keep your options open and your alliances based on need, not loyalty or shared values. And that was the 33 Strategies of War. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Now we're uh, Maria Bartiromo, and she's talking about Donald Trump here. Let's see if we've got this right. Uh, to Minnesota for a high-priced uh, fundraiser. Trump saying he's stuck in a, quote, ice box while leaving court yesterday. So there, that's the little quote I was looking for. Uh, because it's important, because we're in a, so- in a society and a culture of fear and a culture of pity, where people are not looking to be admired as, as much as a lot of people that still do, but there, are, there seems to be the dominant trend, let's put it that way, of being pitiable. Feel sorry for me. Feel sorry for me. Feel sorry for me. Instead of admire me and respect me. Um, and now Donald Trump, I admire because he is admirable. And I respect him because he is respectable. But even Donald Trump is falling victim to this mindset or psyche set, you know, the the psychology of uh, being pitied, of feel sorry for me because the judge won't let me talk. Um, I like the idea. I would like to see Donald Trump go into court and tell the judge the way it is. Um, Instead of asking permission to go to his son's graduation, which, by the way, the the judge has belatedly um, granted Instead of asking permission, you go into court and you say, I'm going to my son's. I mean, if I'm a billionaire like Donald Trump, I'd love to sit in front of a judge and say, I'm going to my, uh, and say it in open court, you know, for for the record. I'm going to my son's graduation on whatever date it is. And then the judge can say, no, no, you're not going to do it. And I would say, I'm going to do that. I don't need your permission. I'm going and there's nothing you can do about it. That is admirable. That is respectable. And then you follow it up and you do it. And then you let the chips fall where they may. If this uh, uh, judge wants to go ahead and, um, you know, put you in jail or otherwise cite you for contempt, uh, let him give it his best shot. You got to remember also 
uh, in this in the more more uh, in the, in this context, the judge. The judge works for us; we don't work for him. Okay, that's the way it is. The judge is not entitled to anything. The judge doesn't have any extra rights. He has rights as an individual, but no rights as a judge. Okay, so he has no right to uh, having uh, Donald Trump in the courtroom. He has no right, as a matter of fact, to a, uh, you'll hear, uh, order in the court. He has no right to it. It's up to us. If we decide that his court uh, is going to end up being a circus, that's what it's going to be, and he's got nothing to say about it. Too bad. So sad. Um, so a lot of people in government think, again, they have rights, and so they can force things to happen. No, they don't. No, they can't. And But again, going back to the admiration situation, Donald Trump goes into court and says, I'm going, and there's nothing you can do about it. That's admirable. But to come out and say, oh, I'm caught in an icebox. Ugh. Ugh. So be admirable not pitiable. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now a little bit more of uh, Maria Bartiromo uh, with uh, Senator Ted Cruz. The Democrats want 11 million illegal immigrants here. Why? Because they want every one of them to be future Democrat voters. No, he's wrong. They want them here to shore up Social Security. In the, I read yesterday in my uh, podcast that uh, the, a, the preamble to the 2016 Democrat convention where the Democrat Party takes credit for Social Security. They could, and I, I'm, I'm sure they do, and they uh, think of it as their crown, the crown jewel of uh, their accomplishments uh, over the centuries. Now, uh, they're not going to let it go without a fight, but it's due to go bankrupt in 2035. So that's why they flood the country. It's not that they, they so desperately need new voters. That they were able to get Joe Biden elected president in 2020. So they can't be that desperate for voters. In any case, uh, Social Security, keep your eye on the ball. It's Social Security that's at issue here. Now, Ted Cruz isn't going to admit it, because if he does, then he makes the so the Democrats look like heroes and he exposes a weakness in the Republican Party, namely that the Republican Party has no solution for the pending Social Security crisis. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now we'll finish up Chapter 63 from The Enemies of My Country. Suppressor into the man's chest. Cancer fired a double tap and watched the flashes momentarily illuminate his target before he collapsed dead. Turning to assist his teammates, Cancer saw them engaged in a fight marked by the suppressed gunshots at near point-blank range before finding a sight that struck him as somewhere between absurd and comical. Riley, wisely choosing not to fire his unsuppressed pistol at risk of warning additional enemy overhead, now held a man in a headlock, wheeling him sideways to prevent him from being able to effectively grasp his slung rifle. Cancer closed on Riley with two quick steps and delivered a hard punch to the man's head. Riley held his opponent in a crushing headlock, squeezing his throat in a vice-like grip as Cancer's first blow impacted against his skull. Ordinarily, Cancer would be Johnny on the spot with his fighting knife, but he'd had to ditch that particular tool after the metalworking factory raid, and now he resorted to pummeling the man's face with a fist. But physical strength was Riley's area of expertise, not Cancer's. After three blows failed to knock the man unconscious, Riley was fed up. Hold this, he said, releasing his headlock and shoving the man toward his teammate. Cancer struggled to grasp the disoriented man, turning him just in time for Riley to deliver a savage blow that cracked across the man's face and sent him and Cancer flying backward into the wall. Then Riley drew his pistol, ducking into the stairwell to provide security for his teammates currently dispatching the remaining enemy fighters behind him. He held his aim toward the closed door atop the final stretch of stairs, waiting for the suppressed gunfire to abate and hearing the last subsonic bullet impact the floor without a follow-up. 
The stairwell was too tight to fit two men across, and the seconds it would have taken him to descend and allow his teammates to go first were apparently deemed too long by David, who whispered sharply behind him. Go! So Riley did, his left arm throbbing in agony, mind keenly aware that the pistol in his right hand was no match for whatever enemy were waiting on the top deck, prepared to launch their rocket attack against his nation's capital. He charged upward nonetheless, closing on the rooftop deck with the single thought that he'd have to clear the doorway as quickly as possible, then get the hell out of the way so his three teammates could put their rifles to good use. But as if in a dream, Riley reached for the handle, only to feel it turning of its own volition. Then the door was pulled outward by a single man whose face was lit by a shifting cascade of light under his night vision. The face-to-face -face encounter lasted a fraction of a second. Riley's thoughts were remarkably clear and linear. He was unsure if one of his teammates could take a suppressed shot from their angled position on the stairs, and briefly considered ducking out of the way to let them try and thus preserve the element of surprise. But this man held a submachine gun in one hand, and a single burst from that could wound or kill Riley's entire team in the time it took them to hear it opening fire. There was only one thing to do, and Riley did it with astonishing speed. Canting his pistol upward, he fired a single shot that passed through the man's lower jaw, propelling through his brain and killing him in place. Then Riley plunged forward to tackle the man out of the doorway, slamming him onto the top deck to clear the way for his teammates, and struggling to aim his pistol forward as he registered a dazzling display of neon color illuminating the night sky. I vaulted Riley's body in a single long stride, cutting left to clear the doorway as I took in the incomprehensible sight beyond. The rooftop deck was almost completely filled by metal tubes angled upward in neat rows, linked by daisy-chained wires that would fire them in a near-simultaneous succession. But that was only the second most stunning feature of the view atop the ship. To my front right, the Washington, D.C. skyline was stark against the deep, booming explosions of fireworks, a brilliant and blinding cycle of colored sparks that turned the night into a shifting sky of radiant color. I registered the incoming and outgoing gunfire from my team, battling an unknown number of fleeting shadows darting amid the network of rocket tubes, the vast majority of which held a payload whose lethality was going to be sent screaming into the capital within the next 20 seconds. I visually traced the cords as they snaked between rows of metal tubes, seeing that they descended on a single point at the front right edge of the deck. I took off at a sprint, running toward the spot with a speed beyond anything my exhausted condition should have allowed. Then I saw another figure doing the same, running five long paces ahead of me. I knew at once this was Bari Khan. He was going to fire the rockets himself, and whatever device waited to initiate that process, he was making his way toward it now. To my right, I saw a shifting view of the Washington Monument reaching skyward, its vertical height coming abreast of the ship as we fought to overtake the enemy. The boat began slowing then at what had to be the designated stopping point on the river, a calculated position that every rocket tube had been aligned off of to send their deadly cargo screaming toward the National Mall. The entire crux of my team's efforts since targeting this man across two continents now fell upon me amid the fireworks exploding overhead. I fired on the run, blasting imprecise shots toward Bari Khan's fleeing figure until my rifle bolt locked backward on an empty chamber, but at least one bullet had found its mark. He lurched forward, stumbling as he struggled to regain his footing. Still running at full speed, I closed the distance between us and, with a final leap, tackled him from behind. We crashed to the ground, him on his side with me on top of him. I sat up on my knees, taking hold of his head in both hands and jerking it upward. Before I could smash his skull against the deck, every muscle in my body went rigid with blinding pain. A cold metal blade was sliding into my abdomen, the soundtrack of firework blasts fading into a vague white noise as the air rushed out of my lungs. I instinctively braced my hands against his right arm, forcing it down to the deck as the blade withdrew from my stomach. My strength began fading then, vision registering the knife in Bari Khan's right hand as I looked to his opposite side, searching for a firing device. I found it clutched in his left hand, with the handle pulled to extension. The time fuse was already burning, and it was too late to stop the launch. My eyes followed a thin wire toward the first metal tube in an array of hundreds linked by a single snaking wire, and while pinning Bari Khan down with my full body weight, I searched for someone who could help. The only figure I saw was Riley, running toward me with a pistol in one hand. 
My breaths were constricted, each gasp of air shallower than the last. I used my last remaining breath to cry out, Doc! Break the chain! Riley's gaze followed the wires to the first tube. He flung his pistol to the deck, drawing a grenade and slowing to a halt in three stuttering steps as he used his injured arm to yank the pin free. Beneath me, Bari Khan was struggling to bring the knife back into my side, the point breaking skin as another searing torrent of blood spilled out. The pain brought with it a momentary surge of adrenaline, and I rested his right hand for control of the knife before the rest of my strength gave out. I fell atop him, feeling hard metal against my sternum, the knife's handle. The blade plunged inside Bari Khan's chest, penetrating his breastbone under my weight. He gasped as a bloody froth formed at his lips, bubbling and spewing across the side of his face as he said with impossible calmness, This is just the beginning. He was mortally wounded and used his final breath to rasp the words, Mayhem, Batime, Wo Yao, Hui, Jal. Then he went still, my vision beginning to narrow as blackness closed on the periphery. I tried to focus, looking up to see Riley heaving his grenade, its spinning black orb crossing a sky of dazzling color on its flight to the first rocket tube. It descended to its final point of impact, one that I desperately hoped would destroy the daisy chain before it began. I watched in horror as it fell short, detonating in a fireball between the second and third tubes. Shards of metal flew outward from the blast, hissing through the air as the grenade's echo faded to a second explosion, this one a deep popping sound that originated from the first tube. The next seconds proceeded as if in slow motion, a terrible progression lit by the nightmarish red and blue glow of fireworks blasting in the sky. I was moments from blacking out, struggling to focus as I saw a single rocket launch. It appeared as little more than a flashing shadow that sailed 20 meters out of the tube before its motor ignited. Then a sparkling orange glow appeared at the tail, marking the rocket's progress until it streaked out of sight, arcing through the night on a flight path toward the National Mall. Then a jet-black veil overtook my view, and I passed out atop my enemy's corpse. And that was the uh, second half of Chapter 63, From the Enemies of My Country, by Jason Casper. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. The following is a, one of my voiceover demos. If uh, you're a voiceover artist and you would like to advertise one of your demos on my podcast, please send an MP3 to the drill12, all one word, at gmail.com. That's the drill12 at gmail.com. Back in a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Caesar's Palace for 12 rounds of boxing. In the red corner, from Los Angeles, California, wearing the red trunks with the gold trim, weighing in at 125 pounds, the lightweight champion of the world, Danny Little Red Lopez. Well, Bill, our winners get a home theater receiver. That's right. Experience the full potential of high-definition video with this 72-channel digital home theater receiver from Yamaha. But wait, that's not all. They also get a 5.1-channel surround sound system from Mirage. With five palm-sized speakers and a compact subwoofer cube, the MX 5.1 brings you huge immersive sound with Mirage's omnipolar technology. All from the Spiegel Catalog, Chicago, Illinois, 60609. And they're taking closer order as down the stretch they come. Mr. Hot Stuff has three lengths to make up with Chocolate Candy Last. On the rail, take the points behind that gallant son with Chocolate Candy gaining on the out side. In the lead is Pioneer of the Nile being tackled by Chocolate Candy. They're neck and neck as they come to the wire. 
and Pioneer of the Nile holds off Chocolate Candy and wins the Santa Anita Derby. And now, on your feet, time to greet holder of 14 NBA titles, your home team, your Los Angeles Lakers. Number three at 6'8", fifth year out of UCLA, playing forward Trevor Ariza. Starting at center, number 17 at seven feet, fourth year out of St. Andrews High School, Andrew Bynum. And at guard, number 24, 6'6", 13th season out of Loyal Marion High School, Kobe Bryant. Thank you, thank you. This is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States today, bidding adios to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there and reminding you that you are not neutral and that the government has no rights.